This is ISCI 2001, Chapter 20, The Nature of Living Things. The themes for this lecture include the characteristics of life, the cell theory, and cell membranes. Characteristics of life. What makes something classified as living? Living things carry out the following processes. Okay, They have metabolic processes, generative um, processes, responsive processes, and control processes, as well as sharing um, some basic structural similarities. With metabolic processes, all the chemical reactions involving molecules required for a cell to grow, reproduce, and make um, repairs are referred to as its metabolism, and those metabolic properties keep cells alive. What you see here in this picture are um, just some basic metabolic properties. Um, you don't even, we don't even um, skim the tip of the iceberg here. This is just some basic metabolic process pathways that we see in a typical cell with um, your carbohydrate um, metabolism that you can see here. You can see the lipid metabolism here. Um, so carbohydrate would be like your sugars, your lipids would be your fats. Um, energy metabolism could be um, either breaking down your lipids, breaking down uh, your sugars. You've got the amino acid metabolism, which is from um, proteins. You've got your nucleotide metabolism, which is from uh, your DNA and your um, genes. You've got metabolism of your other amino acids, um, not to mention um, your other ones um, that are very very, very in-depth. So this is, like I said, a very um, basic overview of some of the pathways, and it doesn't even include um, the chemical reactions. It's just showing you the pathways, all of the different colors um, or ways that it can go. And this is just in one typical cell. This doesn't even include uh, your more specialized cells like liver cells and um, pancreatic cells and stuff like that. So, um, you know, it's a very, very in-depth study. You could actually take each one of these different metabolic pathways and, um, you know, take a full class that takes a full semester um, to study just, you know, one of them um, to learn just a little bit about them. So um, they can be very, very in-depth. All right, so continuing with, with the metabolic processes, all the chemical reactions in the body, all the time needed um, for movement, energy, and growth. Um, here you can see uh, with the plants that are, you've got the roots down at the bottom that are taking up um, the, the water, not just the water, but also minerals and nitrogen and that kind of stuff. They're uptaking nutrients. So Roots don't just take up water, they also take up nutrients, even though the leaves are what mainly um, make the food, your, the roots also need to bring some of the minerals up. Um, that's why you sometimes see, you know, those huge pumpkins that are grown or those huge tomatoes or, you know, you've got better crop yields than others because um, of the fertilizers that are used that are put into the soils, the nitrates and that kind of stuff that the roots are taking up. So you've got your nutrient uptake. Then you've got um, the middle picture here is showing the nutrient processing here in the gut of the cow. And then the last picture, um, kind of funny, it's got the little boy um, with the waste elimination. So kind of a funny picture. So, but your three basic um, metabolic processes of nutrient uptake, nutrient processing, and then your waste elimination. All right, generative processes. Now, generally, when we take when we think about your generative processes, we think about mainly just reproduction. But these are the reactions that result in an increase in the size of an individual organism, like growth, also, um, not just in the increase in the individuals in a population, such as reproduction. So during growth, the living things will actually add to their structure, repair their parts, store their nutrients for later use. And um, growth and reproduction are directly related to, to metabolism, since neither can occur without the acquisition and the processing of nutrients. So this first picture here, what this is showing is, um, you can refer to it as asexual reproduction, because that is essentially what it is. You've got one cell that splits into two cells. 
that is the definition of asexual reproduction. Um, this picture could be a bacteria, it could be um, a protozoa, or it could be one of your skin cells. Um, so we do have asexual reproduction that happens in our body for growth. The picture on the right, um, this is a picture of the, the big... Uh, the big round, that is an egg, and all the squiggly things on the outside of it are the sperm. So that is going to be for sexual reproduction. And, of course, the one egg is going to fuse with one sperm. Um, so the, the two cells, one egg, one sperm, one plus one, um, you add those two together and you're going to get one. So that's an instance where one plus one equals one. <laughs> so, but, um, yeah, so you've got two things that combine to make one in sexual reproduction. Okay, so for growth on the left-hand side, you can see um, that is a cell that is splitting in two to um, make two identical cells um, for growth. On the right-hand side, um, you can see an infant. And just to, to kind of elaborate more on the growth part of it, um, an infant has to grow so much between the time it is conceived from sperm and egg to the time it is an adult. Um, it, co it goes from being one cell to millions and just trillions of cells. So, you know, keep in mind that that one cell has to replicate so many times. Um, so growth is a huge part um, of where our metabolism actually goes to. Um, and reproduction is a very, very small part of um, the generative process in the grand scheme of things. Next, we have the responsive process. The responsive process has been organized into um, basically three categories. You've got the irritability, the individual adaptations, and then the population adaptation. We also kind of refer to that as evolution. Irritability, it's not really talking about uh, like being angry or you know upset or anything like that. It's, it's talking more about like if you were to hit your hand with a hammer or if you were to get a mosquito bite or if you were to get an itchy rash or something like that. It's a, it's a reaction uh, that you have to something else. Um, the individual, um, response is going to be, uh, more like either, uh, the picture that we have here of the infant, um, that is responding to the toy, you know, that's close up. One of the milestones for a two month old is to be able to, um, visually fixate on, uh, on some type of, uh, item that's close up. Um, and that is an individual response um, or an individual adaptation. So that is one of the things that, you know, is a responsive process for them. Um, another one would be like if you have a brown rabbit in the spring that, you know, while it's warm or during the summer, whenever it gets cold outside or when there's snow on the ground, that rabbit will actually adapt individually and will turn white. While the same type of rabbit, if at the same time, if it is still in a warm climate, it will still be brown. So they will individually adapt. Um, they won't all turn white just because it's December. Um, they'll turn white as there's snow on the ground in its region. Um, the last one, the evolution. Um, the picture that I have up is the evolution of the, um, of the horse. And basically, this process occurs over long periods of time, and it enables a species, um, which is a specific kind of organism, to adapt and better survive over long-term changes in its environment over many generations. Um, so it doesn't happen over just one or two generations. It happens over many, 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 many generations. All right, with this responsive process, what you have is you've, you've got this big boulder. And on this boulder, you've got um, these little clam-like creatures. These are called mussels. Um, these mussels are cemented to the rock. Okay, so they can't move. Now, also on this rock, you've got all of these starfish. Okay, now they are not cemented. They actually can move. But this rock was actually... Um, it was underwater, and so, um, here's some water, okay, it was underwater, well, uh, while it was underwater, that's when all the starfish got on it, okay, 
and the starfish were eating the mussels. So there were actually probably some more um, some more mussels down on the bottom parts of it. <clears throat> so down in this area, there were probably more mussels, and the starfish were eating them. Now, how does this relate to the responsive processes? Okay. Well, number one, um, with the individual adaptation, the starfish have been able to adapt to the mussels and to how they, uh, well, all of them have been able to adapt to being able to live out of water. Okay, that's the, that's the first thing, the high tide and the low tide. Um, that's an individual adaptation for both the mussels and the starfish. They don't dry out. That's an adaptation um, that they've had, and that's also a population adaptation that they've had of evolution over time. The irritability part is these starfish, what they will do <clears throat> is they have an enzyme, okay? Let's take, let's take this starfish right here, okay? This starfish right here, if it finds a muscle that it likes, okay, what's gonna happen is it's gonna get on top of it and it's gonna start secreting this enzyme Okay, and so what's going to happen is this enzyme is it's going to basically kind of like spit the enzyme out on top of it. Well, it's going to start making the muscle, this clam, okay, it's called a muscle. It's going to make uh, it where it cannot hold its, its shell shut any longer. It's going to start dissolving um, and it's not going to be capable of staying shut anymore. So as the muscle slowly starts to open up, it's actually going to push its stomach out, okay? The starfish will push its stomach out and will dissolve the, um, the muscle. So the irritability part is how the starfish puts the enzyme onto the muscle. And the irritability part is how the muscle is irritated by the enzyme. So um, the individual adaptation is the starfish's ability to be able to push its stomach out and adapt to be able to do that to the muscle. The evolution is um, the ability of the starfish and the muscle to both be able to thrive outside of the water um, during the low tide uh, part of the day. So that's kind of cool. All right, control processes. <clears throat> The control processes of coordination and regulation um, are the fourth characteristic of life. And the control processes um, are mechanisms that ensure that the organism are going to be able to carry out the metabolic activities in the proper sequence. Okay, We want to be able to have coordination and um, we want to be able to have regulation. So we want to be able to have the proper sequence at the proper rate. So coordination and regulation. So all the chemical react, uh, all the chemical regulations of an organism are coordinated and linked together in specific biochemical pathways. Okay, um, the picture that we have here is of what happens during birth and delivery, um, or labor and delivery. What happens is it, your brain is going to send out uh, a signal. Okay, well, actually. It all starts with the baby. The baby is going to say, okay, I'm ready to get out of here. And the baby will actually start sending, um, it's almost like a, not a panic signal, but a, uh, the, the baby's body will release almost like a hormone to, your, to the mother's body. And when that happens, the hypothalamus that's up here in the mother's brain will start releasing a hormone um, all the way to the mother's uterus, okay? And um, when the mother's uterus receives that uh, hormone stimulation, it'll start contracting. But when it starts contracting, it actually causes the cervix to dilate, which means it causes the cervix uh, to expand or to open. Um, and then as that happens uh, throughout um, the stages during the active phase of labor, um, the baby will actually be pushed out through um, the contracting of the <clears throat> excuse me through the contracting of the uterus. Now, something that you need to also um, understand is that all of this coordination, um, 
there are specific enzymes that are responsible for this. So these hormone these horm- hormones are not just magically released. The baby doesn't just magically release them. Um, what's responsible for the releasing of them are um, these things called enzymes. Enzymes are actually made of proteins, but um, these enzymes um, are re- are in the baby's body, and once they are accumulated to a certain point. Um, it's what triggers the hormones, and then that is what triggers our bodies also. So um, our bodies are, are basically ran by enzymes, and those are what triggers the hormones. So um, so with the enzymes uh, continuing the control processes, what these enzymes do is um, here at the bottom is the enzyme. Uh, this red part at the top here, this is called a substrate. And what happens is, is this substrate is actually one solid thing, okay? It doesn't break off in, into two sections until after the enzyme has worked on it. So um, one thing that's important to know, though, is that once this enzyme has done its job, it can still be used over and over and over. It's n- it's never really used up, Um so it's not just like a one-time deal and it's done. Um, and it's like a lock and key method. So um, what I want you to see is I'm going to erase this so you can see it a little bit better. Um, it's a lock and key method. Um, if you can see right in here, this fits basically like perfect. Okay, It's a specific design in there. Um, it would be like... Um, me trying to use my house key to crank my vehicle okay it just it just doesn't work like if my vehicle was the enzyme and my house key was the substrate like that doesn't work right so only my vehicle key is going to crank my vehicle so that's the same thing with an enzyme and a substrate um and basically the whole point behind enzymes are to um, maintain homeostasis and homeostasis is basically you want to keep your body balanced okay Um, and in order to keep your body balanced um, you know the enzymes do it Um, so your definition of homeostasis just a general definition is um, maintaining a stable internal environment Um, and that's just you know a general uh, definition that you're going to find basically in any um, textbook but um, I think that the def or not the definition, but the example that your book gives is if you were to go for a run, uh, if you're to be rigor- rigorously running, in order to maintain homeostasis, um, you would have to start uh, breathing a lot more um, to be able to repay the oxygen that you're depleting, and your heart would have to beat a lot faster to be able to deliver that oxygen. Um, so that's one of the ways that you repay. Uh, or that you maintain homeostasis. Another way would be like sweating if you're getting too hot or shivering if you're getting too cold because when you shiver, you're generating body heat um, because your body temperature is getting too low. Um, So make sure you know what an enzyme is and what homeostasis is. That's pretty important. In addition to um, the four previous basic processes um, that are typical of living things, they also have to share some basic structural similarities. And basically, every living thing has to have at least one cell. So we start with cells down here. Um, when you have a group um, of similar cells, okay? Well, actually, this all is one cell. This is a nerve cell. When you have a group of similar nerve cells, it makes up nervous tissue. Um, this nervous tissue will make up um, an organ. Um, a group of similar organs made of this tissue is going to make up an organ system. Um, a group of organ systems is going to make up an organism. This organism, along with the same type of organism, okay, of the same kind, is going to make up a population. For example, this is a herd of bison. This is a population of bison. Then the community are the populations that live together in a defined area. This is everything living. So here we have the hulk, uh, we have the snake, we have the bison, we have the prairie dog, and of course the grass because grass is also living because it's a plant. Um, The next level up is the ecosystem and it includes everything that we just said that was living 
plus the air, the water, um, and the rocks. So that includes the mountains. So um, the community is the living and the non-living part. And then you have the biosphere, which is composed of all the ecosystems of the world. It's all the living and the non-living parts of the world. So it's basically the whole earth. Um, so all living things are organized into complex structural levels. Cells, uh, groups of the similar cells make up tissues. Groups of similar tissues make up organs. Groups of similar organs make up organ systems. Groups of organ systems make up organisms, etc., etc., etc. So let's talk about the cell theory for a second. Um, the term cell refers to the basic functional and structural unit that's going to make up all living things. Um, there's a, a thing called the cell theory, obviously, because we're talking about it. But the cell theory has three parts of it. And um, when it wasn't made by one person, it was actually made by uh, several different guys. Um, it was basically stated that everything living has to be made of at least one cell. Okay, so uh, it can be unicellular, which means it can be made of one cell, or it can be multicellular, which is more than one cell. Um, the second part of the cell theory is that cells are the basic unit of life. So that's pretty given too. The third part of the cell theory is that cells can only come from existing cells. They can't just spontaneously generate. Like um, you can't just have like a piece of um, steak laying out on the counter and then from that steak you get flies because that's they people used to think that you know they they used to think that dead meat is where maggots and flies came from and then through um this guy named reddy he performed some experiments and you know he's the one that actually figured out hey you know maggots actually come from flies and um you know they turn into flies um flies lay their eggs on you know meat so that's where they come from. So they figured out that one specific type of cell can only come from that same type of cell. Skin cells come from skin cells. Uh, liver cells come from liver cells. Bone cells come from bone cells. Um, you get a fly from a fly. You get a human from a human. You get a dog from a dog. So, But we will really focus on specific aspects of cells um, in the next lecture. However... Um, where does the name cell come from? Um, uh, basically you have to go back to, um, this guy named Robert Hooke. Uh, he was the first guy to identify cells and he was looking through, he made this microscope, uh, and, uh, he was, he had sliced up some cork at home and we'll actually do this in a live experiment in a couple of weeks. And he sliced up some cork really thinly and put it up underneath his microscope and looked at it and, um, cork comes from... Um, from plants, so from tree bark, and when he was looking at it, he noticed that all of the uh, the cork would look like it was made of boxes um, that were, you know, rectangle or square, so uh, he said they looked like the rooms or the cell of a monastery that are in the monastery, and so he called them cells. So that's actually where the name cell came from, was he said that the boxes look like the poor little barren rooms of a monastery. Um, so that's where the name came from. All right, like I said, we will actually get into the actual detailed part of cells um, a little bit later on. But um, we'll do just a general overview. Um, you've got your nucleus here. Uh, you've got your rough endoplasmic reticulum here. And here, and basically its job is to modify uh, proteins. Your nucleus, obviously, it holds um, your DNA, which is spread throughout here. And your nucleolus is here. It's inside the uh, nucleus. Um, you've got uh, little things called um, mitochondria, and those are going to be here. You have, um, this is your Golgi apparatus, and its job is to package up macromolecules and send them throughout the cell for the cell's use. Um, you've got peroxisomes and lysosomes, um, and their job is to basically break down, uh, stuff in the cell that 
the cell doesn't need anymore. Okay, and you've also got um, your centrioles. Your centrioles um, are basically only used for cell division. You've got um, your smooth endoplasmic reticulum, which makes lipids. You've got um, microtubules, which is this little red one here, and your microfilaments, which are your light pink ones here. Those are part of your cytoskeleton, and they're used for moving organelles around the cell and for um, basic cell structure. Uh, let's see if I've missed anything. Uh, your chromatin is inside of your nucleus. That's what holds your DNA. Um, your cilia, which is on the outside of the cell, um, most of our cells don't have this. This is only really found inside of our, uh, like our trachea or our bronchial tubes. But um, that's used for either moving like mucus out of our uh, bronchial tubes or for actually moving the actual cell. And then, oh, of course, our, um, our plasma membrane, which is what actually holds our whole cell together. It keeps it in a nice little package. So, but uh, like I said, we'll actually talk about this more in depth um, in the upcoming weeks. One feature common to all cells and many of the organelles um, they contain is a thin layer of material called the membrane. Uh, some people call it the plasma membrane. Um, plasma membrane. Some people call it the cell membrane. Some people call it the lipid bilayer. Some people call it the fluid mosaic. Um, there's so many different names for it, but the function of a membrane correlates to its location either around or within the cell. And cell membranes are just basically thin sheets made up of phospholipids. Um, keyword there is lipid, which is another name for fat. Um, you know, we need fats in our body. Fats are good. Um, you know, there are good fats and bad fats. This is a good fat. So it's made up of phospholipids and proteins. Okay, so... Membranes in all cells are composed of proteins and phospholipids. We just said that there are two layers of phospholipids, um, and they're oriented so that their um, hydrophobic tails are extended towards each other. Okay, so these little squiggly lines down here, you see the dark blue squiggly lines? Okay, those are the um, hydrophobic fatty tails. They extend towards each other, and the hydrophilic glycerol heads are on the outside. Those are the little balls, like, right in here. Um... They're on the outside. The phosphate-containing chain of the phospholipid is coiled near the glycerol portion. Buried within the phospholipid layer and or floating on it are the globular proteins. Okay, so you've got proteins all in there. Um, some of these proteins accumulate materials from the outside of the cell. Others act as sites of chemical activity where things can bond. And then you've got carbohydrates. Um, they're often attached to one of the surfaces of the membranes. Um, You've got like integral proteins like here. Uh, let me change colors. Okay. You've got um, like here's your protein. Basically what happens is, is it has like a channel on the inside of it. And if you've got a large molecule that's needing to come through, um, it'll actually let it pass through. Um, pass through there. So if it is a, um, if it's something small, if it's a smaller molecule that needs to pass through here, um, these phospholipids will actually let it just pass right on through. But like I said, if it's larger, then it'll need to go through uh, that integral protein. Okay, so let's talk a li little bit more about the phospholipid bilayer. Okay. I said that you've got a hydrophilic head and you've got a hydrophobic tail. So hydro, um, we said that hydro, okay, hydro means water. Okay, hydro means water. Philic actually means love. Okay, so philic means love. Now, uh, if we have a hydrophilic and then we have a hydrophobic, okay, hydro still means water, okay, and what's the opposite of love? Hate, okay, boo. So you've got hydrophilic heads and hydrophobic tails. So these tails here, they hate water. They do not like water at all. They do not want water touching them, okay? 
um, as opposed to your hydrophilic heads. They like water. They don't mind water touching them at all. Now, the reason why this is is because um, you've heard the saying, oil and water don't mix, right? Um, that's because any type of fat, whether it's in oil or whatever, it is a waterproofing um, substance because it's got a hydrophobic property, okay? It doesn't like water. It repels water. So the reason why it's important for us to have a phospholipid bilayer is because it gives our cell waterproofing. It makes it where when we have that double membrane around our cell, it makes it where water can't just come in as much as it wants to because if it did, it could actually explode the cell. And that's not a good thing. We don't want that, okay? We want there to be a good balance. So we don't want that. We want it to be happy. We don't want it to be um, so full of water that it's rupturing because that would actually cause us to die. That wouldn't be a good thing. All right, so let's talk about mem membrane transport. You've got two types of membrane transport. You have passive transport and active transport. Passive transport means it requires no energy, okay? Your body does it naturally. Uh, it doesn't require anything from your body whatsoever. It actually happens um, in the environment naturally. It happens in your body naturally. So uh, diffusion is going to be the movement of a substance from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. Um, you could kind of pretend like this is uh, like a can of air freshener if you wanted to, or even a, a perfume bottle. Okay, whenever you spray it, it's going to be high concentration at first, and then it's just kind of kind of spread out over time, right? So um, it's just moving from an area where it's highly concentrated to where it's more spread out and uh you know, more even. When it is evenly dispersed, we actually call that dynamic equilibrium. Um, the molecules are still going to be moving around, but there's not going to be a net movement, which means um, there's not going to be an area that's higher than another. It's going to all stay equal. Osmosis is the diffusion of water. Water is the key word here. Um, and not just water, but selectively permeable membranes. Okay, a selectively permeable membrane is a membrane that will allow some things to pass through but not others. So osmosis is where water molecules will diffuse through a cell membrane and this movement of water molecules through a selectively permeable membrane is called osmosis. Okay, so uh, next slide we'll see an example of that. Okay, so here you have um, concentrated sugar solution. Okay, here you have your selectively permeable membrane. Okay, you see it dotted all the way up. And then on, on this side here, it's a diluted uh, sugar solution. So what's going to happen here is you've got your, your dark red color. That is your sugar. And you see how much larger it is than your smaller blue molecules? What's going to happen is this um, selectively permeable membrane is only going to let the small molecules pass through it. So whenever osmosis occurs you're going to see that the water level is actually going to be a lot lower um, than this one over here. This one over here is going to raise because it's not going to let um, the sugar pass through it. Okay, um, It's not going to let the sugar pass through because the sugar is too big to fit through the hole. But the water is going to want to pass through because it's actually going to want to dilute um, the solution over here. Okay, Because we want our bodies to... Um, to be at equilibrium. Remember that homeostasis. We want it to be a stable internal environment um, that is well balanced. We want that dynamic equilibrium. So our body is going to do whatever it has to do in order to maintain that equilibrium, even if that means pushing water out of our cell. Okay. Now with facilitated diffusion, um, the rate of diffusion of a substance is increased in the presence uh, of a carrier protein found in the cell membrane. There are actually two different types of facilitated diffusion, and one is a passive transport, one is an active transport. Um, as long as the facilitated diffusion uses um, the molecule's kinetic energy, then it's still technically a passive transport because it's not actually using cellular energy. But um, 
and with it using the kinetic energy, it's still moving from um, an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. However, if it starts moving from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration, um, that's when we move into the active transport um, process. And that's when it's using um, a carrier process, um, kind of how, or a carrier protein um, process like uh, in the, like it's showing in the picture. Um, what is happening is ion channels can be open or closed to allow uh, sodium ions to be transported to the other side of the membrane. So when you have like sodium potassium pumps and that kind of thing, when the signal molecule binds to the ion channel pumps, the gate is opened and so it allows um, sodium ions or potassium um, ions to be let in or uh, let out depending on what the cell needs. So uh, that is you know, the action of the carrier protein requires an input of energy other than kinetic energy of the molecules. Therefore, it's an active, not a passive transport process. Um, and the active transport mechanisms can transport the molecules or the ions up a concentration gradient from low concentration to high concentration. All right, now phagocytosis, um, this is a type of endocytosis where the um, plasma membrane or the cell membrane actually will engulf a solid food particle and take it into the cell. Um, so it will transport materials into the cell. Typically it is food. So it's just simply the cell membrane wrapping around, uh, typically a solid food particle, taking it into the cell um, to get nutrients from it. Okay, so... At the very end of every lecture, I'll, I will list the GPS standards that um, we either touched on or that we covered. Now, every GPS standard that is listed, it doesn't necessarily mean that we completely covered it. Um, but whenever you do your uh, classroom, you'll understand, um, you'll see how you know you set it up because the standards will be very broad at times and you'll want to make sure that you'll be able to touch on at least some and you'll cross-reference some and you'll see that sometimes uh, you'll be doing a lesson in physical science but it also kind of touches in biology because you'll be talking about the different types of energy um, but you'll see um, with the distinguished from uh, living and non-living how we touched on that was whenever we were talking about um, the different levels of life and when I touched on biosphere and ecosystem and community, um, when we switched from community to ecosystem and I said, you know, the community were all the living parts and then went to ecosystem and I said the rock, the air, um, the water, that was the non-living parts. You know, I'm distinguishing right there living from non-living, so that was pretty simple. Demonstrate the ability to explain characteristics associated with all living things. Cells, which we're going to focus more on um, in the next lecture. But we did talk about growth, reproduction. Heredity will be focused on in a few weeks. We did talk about response to stimuli. Uh, evolutionary adaptation will be focused on later in the semester. Energy metabolism. Uh, exchange of materials with the environment. Uh, and homeostasis we, we touched on just a little bit also. Demonstrate an understanding of the levels of biological organization from cell to tissue, tissue to organ, organ to organ system, organ system to organism, etc., etc. Um, and demonstrate an understanding of the integrated functions of body systems. Now don't forget to go to the discussion board on Georgia View and make sure you post either three questions and or detailed responses. Now make sure that they're more just more than just a yes or no answer to the questions. Um, we want these to be detailed if you want to go and look up um, if there's a question that's posted. You know, you don't have to wait on me to answer it. You can actually go and look up some answers either in your book or um, you know, go online and see if you can look up. Now remember Wikipedia it it's not I mean, there's some answers on there that, yeah, they're, they're right, but um, it's not a truly reliable source. I wouldn't, you know, answers.com, that kind of stuff. I wouldn't completely rely on those. Um, try to go to more trusted websites. Um, and also, don't forget to um, do your first quiz. So those are all due before I post the next lecture next week. So um, I look forward to our next class and doing our first lab. I'll see you all then. Have a great week.